This is CUNY TV, the television station of the greatest urban university in the world. As the sun sets at the end of a New York workday, the mind transitions from daily tasks to the cloudier, more philosophical regions of social issues, culture, and politics. In a democracy, every perspective on the world is important, and people in art and culture have surprising bodies of knowledge that can shed fresh light on today's reality. The following conversations with poet, artist, and filmmaker Cecilia Vicuña and photographer and filmmaker Michael Hausband took place at that time of the day. Cecilia Vicuña is a Chilean poet, artist, and filmmaker based in New York and Santiago. Having experienced the 1973 Chilean coup d'etat, her work addresses themes of memory, decay, and exile. Her most recent museum installations have dealt with ecological destruction, cultural homogenization, and the particular stresses these circumstances place on the powerless. city or how you cope with living in New York City from the sort of beautiful poetic description you gave of listening to the sounds and the countryside and all of those things. What do you do in New York City to get that kind of peace or do you go outside of New York City a lot? It's funny, I don't feel like I live in New York. I feel like I am passing by, mm -hmm. even though this passing by, it's been 40 years and it's a long passing by. And when I first arrived here, um, my building, which is an artist co-op, was immediately next to the Hudson River. So the nearness of the river is the wilderness that yeah. I need. Is that where you get a lot of the materials for your Well, I get a lot of material from New York streets, but if you look at them, it would have a combination of bones, plastic, metal, things from Brooklyn, from New York, from Tierra del Fuego, from the Amazon, from everywhere. So it's not like I only work with beach things. Beaches have become like the depositaries for the rubble of the world. Things wash up, yeah. But it's the same, for example, the water level of the Hudson River has been rising, rising constantly. Mm -hmm. Now on high tide, is at this distance from the sidewalk. So very often I pick up you know, things that the waves deposit mm -hmm. on these walkways mm -hmm. next to the Hudson mm -hmm. is very eerie. But you've been observing this for a long time, and I'm wondering if it's uh, showing up in terms of uh, the way curators and institutions are responding to your work. I mean, you're getting a lot of calls these days to do shows because it seems like finally the effects of climate change are kind of apparent to most people in some way. Yes, it's, it's true, you know. I remember I was a nine-year-old girl when I first saw in a dream what was coming. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the ancient tradition that dreams foretell what is going mm -hmm. to be. And somehow children can tell the difference between a dream that is just an expression of fear mm -hmm. and an expression of a reality that you are meant to be a witness of mm -hmm. and that you have to prepare for. Mm -hmm. And that was my take, even mm -hmm. when I was nine years old, which was the time when I realized I was a writer. Because the, in Spanish, we you have a beautiful word which is nitido, which means that the vision that you see is so sharp and so undeniable that you can tell is more real than the real. You know? mm -hmm. And so when I understood that my dreams had that quality, I started to write. Mm -hmm. So my first uh, texts are from being nine mm -hmm. years old. Were there particular environmental disasters when you were growing up that actually set off the, the dreams? I mean, no, the only one that was happening at the time was earthquakes. Oh, yeah. but Earthquakes were not associated to climate right. change. Mm -hmm. Earthquakes were simply associated to the tectonic plates. Mm -hmm. And they were very violent earthquakes mm -hmm. uh, regularly. Mm -hmm. And so as a child, I was exposed first to the sound. I would lie flat on the floor 
to put my ear so I could hear <laughs> the speech of the earth, mm -hmm. you know. And my dog would start to go, mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. you know. I was going to say, it's like almost like an animal instinct mm -hmm. to feel it or sense it before it even starts to occur. I think it involves a training. I mean, um, when you think of what's happening to humanity now, it's like humanity is being trained to be enslaved, to be reduced, to be just an extension of the machine. Mm -hmm. And if you grew up in Kansas, as I grew up in Chile, we had a completely different training to be alert. To me, it's a crime against knowledge. Mm. It's a crime against the universally diversified knowledge mm -hmm. of peoples, you know. Exotic in a good way. I mean, I, yeah. think, I think now there's, there's an almost demonization of the idea of the exotic, of things being different. The system, as it is the global system, wants everything to be the same, I guess, so it can be yeah. traded and... Controlled and exploited. Exactly. You see, it's the exploitative mind that mm. has taken over this planet and if it continues that way, there will be no planet to yeah. exploit anymore. I think the use increasingly of toxic masculinity and that sort of thing, I think that is uh, a true evil that's unleashed on the land. That ain't real masculinity, it's mm. pretend masculinity. Right. You know, because I know better, mm -hmm. you know, I like men, mm -hmm. and uh, I also like women, but mm -hmm. I like men, and so um, the men I like are not like that at all. Right. I was born in the 40s. And so in the 40s, 50s and 60s, all the way up to the 70s when the military coup was in Chile, Chilean culture was a culture where the main value was the community. You know, the work for what was called el bien común, the common good, mm -hmm. you know. This was beyond an ideology. This was an ethical code. Mm -hmm. And everybody left, right, it didn't matter, religious, non-religious. Value system. Everybody believed that that was a necessary mm -hmm. uh, part of life. Mm -hmm. And actually the main part of life mm -hmm. was the way you behave towards others, mm -hmm. towards uh, especially people who were vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And I remember the disasters in Europe and in Spain after the destruction of the Republic and the Civil War in Spain, my family was among the families that received refugees, you mm -hmm. know, Jews and people from the Spanish Civil War. Mm -hmm. So my family grew up with these refugees as part of the family. Right. And when I think back of how incredibly beautiful that was, right. the richness these people that I consider my uncles mm -hmm. and the love that people shared Mm -hmm. from uh, and gratitude from having been received has lasted a lifetime mm -hmm. and so this is what we are now destroying the possibility of welcoming the possibility yeah. of of enjoying what the mm -hmm. other brings mm -hmm. and the other can only bring beauty mm -hmm. you know beauty and gratitude because they come from suffering they come from the worst possible situations so these people in Chile, they gave so much. Chilean culture, the arts, literature, theater, cinema, everything benefited from their arrival. Mm -hmm. And the same has happened here. People ask me, why do you live in New York when I am the embodiment of the unwanted one? <laughs> a dark little woman, you know, <laughs> Indian, everything. I would say that the reason why I have stayed, I, I only came here to give a performance. I never moved to New York. Mm -hmm. New York moved to me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's basically I was welcomed by a certain kind of people mm -hmm. that maybe only exist in the US, who are the people who go against the tide. Yeah. The people who believe at all cost that this is wrong. I didn't think, oh, I want to stay. I just stayed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I belonged somehow mm -hmm. to those who were interested in hearing the stories, in hearing the poems, in mm -hmm. hearing the songs, in hearing what was it that was coming with me, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. especially because Chile, Chile had been destroyed by the US. Right. So people always ask me, how come that you are here when this is the country that destroyed your family, I destroyed your people? I think that's an people? important point to emphasize that the, the coup d'etat Pinochet's 
uh, coup d'etat was backed by the U.S. and for what reason? I assume to increase markets in Chile mm -hmm. or to destroy the possibility of a true participatory democracy. Mm. Because the claim was to destroy communism, but this was not a communist place mm -hmm. by any means. Mm -hmm. You know, Salvador Allende was a, a democratic socialist. He was for justice without persecution. Mm -hmm. And this had never existed. And it was the most beautiful expression of freedom, equality. And so I was 21. I already had a TV program reaching everybody in Chile, you know, mm -hmm. at 21. Mm -hmm. And at 22, I was having a big exhibition in the National Museum of Fine Arts. Mm -hmm. You know, my poems uh, were performed to 5,000 people. So it was uh, an amazing culture right. that was destroyed. Now Chile is uh, a country that is more like the US. Mm -hmm. So now we have a conservative government and the only value is money. Mm -hmm. It's money and exploitation. I look at the current political situation and wonder how strategically this voice can even come into the conversation if it doesn't require almost like utter collapse of the existing political and economic system to, to allow, you know, this sort of resurgence of old wisdom? Well, we shall see. Mm. We shall see in the next 10 to 20 years, I think the destiny of this planet will be decided. Mm -hmm. And it will be decided in each people's heart. Uh, or be ruled by the yeah. artificial intelligence or those kinds of things. It sounds so yeah. sci-fi, but it's just right on our doorstep. Absolutely. Yeah. Look, people believe that algorithms are the truth mm. and algorithms are really opinions. Mm -hmm. They're just tools to make you believe what the creator of the algorithm mm -hmm. believes, mm -hmm. you see. So people are being manipulated by all kinds of fake information, mm -hmm. fake news. Mm -hmm. Think of the elections in Brazil. Mm -hmm. It was made through fake news, mm -hmm. you know. It was made through the manipulation of information. Mm -hmm. If we become aware of that, there is a chance. And what shape, what form is this transformation, this liberation from the forces that are manipulating the world towards destruction? Yeah. We have no idea. Yeah. But that's part of the beauty. How afraid should we be as Americans of this particular um, president in terms of uh, dictatorship? Very afraid. Mm -hmm. But from fear, nothing can be gained mm. other than the information that this is a true danger mm -hmm. and it's far more dangerous than Americans really believe mm -hmm. because it's a disguised dictatorship mm -hmm. and that is far worse than an open dictatorship. Cecilia Vicuña is one of 10 artists to receive the United States Artist 2019 Fellowship. Her most recent exhibition, Cecilia Vicuña, About to Happen, just opened at the Institute of Contemporary Art Philadelphia and will be on view through March 31st. Michael Hausbund is a photographer and filmmaker born and raised in New York City. While still an undergraduate at the School of Visual Arts, he began taking portraits for magazines. During his career spanning more than 40 years, he toured with the Rolling Stones and photographed many notable celebrities, and most famously, a staged boxing match between Andy Warhol and Jean-Michel Basquiat. You seem to me like you were one of these New York kids who was kind of just like at an early age, like at the factory or just getting to know a lot of famous people in New York. I mean, is that pretty much the story or did it happen more through the photography, portraiture? My memory goes to when I was in boarding school at 14. Um, and I was in school with a couple of classmates whose parents were Jerry Wexler and Tom Dowd, who were producers with Atlantic Records. So we went to the city one day and went to Atlantic Records and I just, like to me, that was an, an incredible opportunity to see a recording studio. And they were ex 
super warm and friendly to me and uh, invited me to come anytime I wanted. And I was much more excited about it than their children were. So I took them up on it in a very serious you know, way and I'd go there every opportunity I had. And then when I left that boarding school and came back to the city, I was obsessed with music. I was obs sort of obsessed with photography and music, kind of getting around on different levels of uh, school and then socially out in like Central Park and dances and I, I was in a band so we got around a lot through that. It seems like a period too when everyone was just like outside of their apartments like out on the scene yeah. and it was a kind of a small town in a way like. I had no idea what I was gonna do and I just kind of took these very low level kind of jobs to make a little money. But you were you were already setting up like a portrait studio when you were in SVA yeah. right? And you were meeting a lot of interesting people there. Yeah, that was kind of like a dream that I'd had once I got into school and I discovered the studio and seamless paper and the whole idea of, you know, studio photography. I wasn't really even formally looking for anything. I just was thinking about it and one day I passed. I kept always walking up Broadway to the Herald Square. All the photo stores mm -hmm. were in Herald Square. Mm -hmm. And I passed the building. Uh, that I kept always looking at thinking that it was so beautiful and uh, this cast iron building it was kind of dilapidated but it was beautiful and I um, one day there was a sign on on it you know uh, lofts for sale and I walked in he showed me this one that I bought and he said it was forty five thousand dollars but I didn't need to have all that money at once I only needed <laughs> a small like 20 30 percent or something and I could get a mortgage Mm -hmm. And I said, well, how does that work? Like, what is a mortgage, you know? So I started from scratch, but mm -hmm. I, I did it. I had the money. I had been working while I was in art school. And that's the place you still live, right? And I'm still there, 40 years. It's 40 years this month. So who yeah. came Who came through? I mean, I know you uh, photographed Warhol and Basquiat and, and a number of other people. Mick Jagger and Jim Carroll and Peter Tosh. It just goes on. There's so many people. And these people came to you because the uh, Rolling Stone or something needed a portrait and they were sent to you, right? Yeah, in the beginning I just hustled. Like I went to every magazine. I mean the first magazine I started working for was Art News and then I got these assignments to photograph Warhol and he mm -hmm. invited, Andy invited me to work with interviews. So that was mm -hmm. a big break for me because mm -hmm. then it, it sort of brought me out into a bigger world right. and, and more exposure but also a bigger community as well. And you end up palling around with Basquiat in Paris, right? And uh, I remember something yeah. that came out, Wilson told me about this in the Paris talk, was that um, he found Paris quite racist at the time. Yeah. Which surprises me because I think, you know, I think back of all of the Americans who like fled New York or the U.S. Yeah. to go to Paris yeah, so they could sort of be, yeah, they yeah. could be kind of treated normally. And I think Jean-Michel really liked Paris. He'd been through a lot when it came to that sort of treatment. Um, it was uh. it was interesting for me to see how he handled people that were put off by him or not sure how to deal with him. You know, as he had his hair um, sticking up and then he was dressing in a lot of, I thought they were cool clothes, but maybe the combination of everything was a little much for people mm -hmm. and they didn't know what to make of it. You know, like a lot of things that happened to us were so alien to me and upsetting, immediately upsetting to me. I had no threshold for that. So he was sort of a target for some attention, bad attention. He was much more familiar and much more comfortable. Knew how to be self-protective as a black guy in the world, probably. Yeah, I mean, he was all kind of all around willing to surrender to things, you know, to dangerous situations much more than I was comfortable with. And I was also like, hey, I am not, you know, like, I'm not doing that or I'm not doing this. I mean, I think he lived his life in a vulnerable way, in a very, mm -hmm. uh, you know, wide open, just dangerous way. So how did the Warhol Basquiat uh, photo shoot come about? That's, that's a good question. Um, I had met Jean-Michel at a photo shoot that I had done for uh, Eric Good for Area of all these artists that he had assembled for a dinner at, at Mr. Chow on 57th Street. And Jean-Michel was in that group. And uh, we spoke a little bit. I had tried to talk to him that night, but he wasn't really receptive. So I left there thinking, well, that mm -hmm. was that. And then a couple of months later, I got a call from uh, Paige Powell, who asked me uh, to come to a dinner that mm -hmm. Andy was having, a private dinner. And I said, yeah, sure, it sounds great. I mean, it was, wasn't uh, unusual. And uh, I didn't think anything much of it. So I, I arrived a little bit late 
and there was only one seat left, and it was right next to Jean-Michel. And I sat down, and he turned to me. I was sort of like, oh, this is going to be difficult to sit next to this person. <laughs> mm -hmm. But he turned to me, and he said, ah, I've been a big fan of your work for many years, for five years, specifically. He said mm -hmm. five years. He said, the picture you, the portrait you made of Klaus Nomi is the first work I've seen of yours, I saw of yours, and I really loved it. And since then, you know, I've liked a lot of work that you've done. And he said, I'd like to talk to you about this project for this boxing poster idea for this collaboration mm -hmm. exhibition he was having with Andy. And uh, he said, would you be interested in making that picture? And I said, yeah, of course, I'd love to do that. But in my mind, I thought, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody bigger than me is going to get that. And uh, we walked outside of the bathroom, and Jean-Michel said to Andy, Michael's going to do that picture of us with the boxing, you know, for the, for the boxing poster. And Jean Andy said, oh, but we asked Robert Maplethorpe to do it. <laughs> and yeah. I said, well, there you go. It didn't yeah, even yeah. last 30 seconds. You know, it's like, <laughs> right, right, right. we're done. It's yeah. done. And so we sat down, and, and Jean-Michel said, no, Michael's going to do it. And Andy said, oh, well. I love Michael's portraits. It'll be great. And how soon did it happen then after it, it that? Was it was a week. Like, we, and they came in. How long was the session? Did it last? About an hour. I heard that Andy didn't like to be touched. You know, I never got any kind of indication that he wanted to be touched either. <laughs> you know, he always seemed pretty stiff, stiff and, and a little bit, you know, a little rigid and a little bit. Um, and he's always warm and friendly, but within this body that wasn't exactly, you know, warm and friendly. Did you have to work to loosen him up or was it? I, Jean did really most of that. You know, right. Jean touched him in ways that I, I felt like, wow, you know, Jean's super comfortable with him. Like there was no <laughs> barrier. Jean wouldn't break, you know, and it was, it was beautiful to see that. You were on the social scene in a moment when there were tons of really interesting gay men in the city who knew all kinds of things like Peter Hujar and Robert Mablethorpe and uh, you know a lot of talent that got mm. wiped out unfortunately by the AIDS crisis. But um, I mean, you absorbed a lot of that just yeah. being around it. The Klaus Nomi sort of circle of people. Um, no, you know, I met Klaus through Joey Arias, and then and Joey even. Uh, my girlfriend was a, at the time, was a textile designer, and mm -hmm. she was always going to Fiorucci, and she loved that place, and Joey was working there. And then I, I became friendly with the, him and then Klaus and all their circle of friends. That's a time when street culture, uh, street fashion, was so influential, explosive here, but also influential on like mass market retail and things throughout the country. And the pictures I was making of Klaus Nomi and his whole circle were also my senior thesis from in art school. Mm -hmm. So I was really, it was such a perfect collaboration. It was exactly the subject matter I was looking for. And, and, and then what it gave back to me in terms of all this richness of uh, vision, uh, knowledge, appreciation of things. You have a pretty methodical style. You have the white background. Sometimes you use a dark background, I think, right? It's very anthropological, right? And like study the figure, let down the mask, that kind of approach. But has that changed at all over time? My whole life changed at the end of my 40s with discovering yoga or wanting to find a yoga practice and then finding one. And everything sort of fit into place because with yoga, that led me to want to feel better. It was making me feel really great to begin with. But then what else is there? Oh, diet. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then learning about food and learning about mm -hmm. all the things that I didn't really ever know about. Mm -hmm. You know, mostly it's also taking you off the track of really being more mindful of what your body needs, what you need right. to be healthy, to right. keep your mind healthy as well. Yeah, exactly. And sharp. And I think that so all that's connected and then to have this opportunity to learn more about farming or be exposed to farming. Sometimes these projects just enable me to just obsess mm -hmm. deeply, as you can appreciate into a subject matter that I have, uh, you know, a, a massive amount of curiosity about or just, you know, some passion for. So, you know, photography and filmmaking have just been great for me to be able to explore worlds that I was attracted to. I met a young surfer who was a bit of a legend himself, and I had always been very much in agreement with his philosophy and everything. And we were introduced by a mutual friend, and he approached me about working on a project together. And surfing was a, one of the few things that I felt was very sacred to me, and I wasn't going to 
mix photography mm -hmm. with it. I somehow, I don't know why, and then when he approached me, I was instantly, yeah, let's go, let's do it. And, uh, you know, um, it was a, an incredible experience, probably the biggest project I've kind of uh, been able to contextualize into a book so mm -hmm. far. Yeah. That film got quite a lot of play, like Art House kind of. Mm. Yeah, I made this movie, surf movie, and it uh, was not really a movie. Like, I didn't set out to make a movie. I right. just brought a camera with me, and, and uh, whenever everybody went out surfing, mm -hmm. I had made 14 mm -hmm. rolls of film, and it became a movie. It, it seemed it just, like rebel culture is actually, you know, in some ways. It's American pop. You know, I'm like a product of American pop culture, so I, you know, all these things are very exciting. I, I always wanted to run away with the circus. I always wanted to, like, you know, do these things that were just, like, kind of edgy, weird. Mm -hmm. So if I couldn't do that, well, what else is there? You know, touring with a rock band. And yeah. I had dreamed of touring with the Rolling Stones when I was 12 years old, you know, when I got the first Stones record. And I mm -hmm. thought, oh, my God, what would it be like to, to travel with these people? And then, you know, this dream become, just comes true at, at tw age 25, 13 years later. You know, it's funny, like, those things that you maybe don't even think about as dreams or, you know, aspirations or, you know, just something that um, all the pieces start falling into place and you just kind of like are working towards making it happen whether you realize it or not. Michael Hall's band's iconic portraits of Andy Warhol and Jean-Michel Basquiat taken during the July 10th, 1985 studio session are currently on view at the Peninsula in New York. The hotel exhibition is part of a series honoring some of the best artists of the 1980s.